thank you to both Dr. Kamal and Dr. Fields for making yourselves available for this and for the attendees that are jumping on board. Thank you for taking the time to join our virtual community lecture series. Um, we had a series that was really well received last month with Dr. Francie Tussard-Romo and, um, and Gail Jackson. The topic for that one was infectious disease, COVID, the flu, and all those sorts of infectious diseases that are on the top of everybody's mind. Um, we had lots of good questions that came through and it was a really good exchange um, at the end. So that was great. And hopefully um, the, pan the attendees that are watching this um, right now will have some thoughts and questions. Please feel free. I'll have the Q&A box and there's a chat function. So I'll have both of those up and running. Um, so if you have thoughts or questions as this goes along, um, please pop those in. And then once the presenters are um, at a spot where they pause in their presentation or done with their presentation, I will ask them the questions that you put out there. So that'll be the easiest way to do that, I think. Um, just a couple words from me and I won't occupy too much time because Dr. Kamal and Dr. Fields will have much more interesting things to say than I, but I just wanted to let the folks on the line know that um, you may or may not know that Newport Hospital has had an award-winning inpatient rehab program as well as an outpatient rehab program that really provides the continuum of care from people being sick in the hospital and then starting to recover, then moving to rehab while they're still in the hospital and recovering from some major illnesses and injuries and then transitioning into the outpatient setting where they can continue to do some treatments and therapies um, when they're back and ready to be at home. And so that continuity of care is really important and it's been going on for more than a century at Newport Hospital. Um, and there's been lots of awards and accolades. Um, and we also have been accredited by what's called CARF, which is the Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Facilities, which is an international uh, program that looks at rehab facilities and really only offers their accreditation to the very top programs. Um, one other thing that's of interesting news is lately, um, we had an inpatient rehab unit at Rhode Island Hospital and due to the COVID pandemic, in order to be helpful to our colleagues as they were getting a lot of COVID patients, they asked us to double the rehab unit at Newport Hospital and this team was able to make that happen, which is a miracle. And so we've been able to accommodate twice as many patients at Newport Hospital and we were really the flagship and the only inpatient rehab facility in the entire system for lifespan. So we're very proud of that. Um, and I'm very proud of the team for their ability to really continue to provide that award-winning care um, despite a pandemic, which is pretty amazing. So with that, um, Dr. Kamal is the medical director for our inpatient rehab unit that I was just speaking of. Um, and so he comes to us, you know, great, you have the little bio up there, that's fantastic. So he comes to us, um, he did his medical degree at King Edward Medical University in Lahore, Pakistan, and then did his residency at the very prestigious hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And so we're proud to have him as our medical director. <clears throat> and then he'll be joined by Dr. Joe Fields, um, who came to us from Cornell University um, and also did his training um, down in Bradenton, Florida, and then his fellowship at New York, um, the prestigious program there um, at New York University and Rusk Institute. So um, some Ivy League, very well um, accredited doctors that lead our rehab programs. Um, they have specialties in things such as pain relief, um, amputations and limb loss, gait dysfunctions, wound care, spasticity, all sorts of interesting topics that physical medicine rehabilitation doctors um, can specialize in. So without much further ado, I will go ahead and hand over the presentation to Drs. Kamal and Dr. Fields. Um, and if you have questions, like I said, please put them in. That's a little bio of me. So I'm an ER doctor and I'm the chief medical officer at Newport. And I certainly won't know as much as Dr. Kamal and Dr. Fields, but I'll be happy to ask them your questions. So please send them along to me and um, I will turn it over to our good panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaines. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today virtually and I hope everybody's staying safe during these trying times. Uh, today's topic for discussion is living well with stroke. As you know, um, in most of our discussions, the first thing we have to do uh, is to describe our specialty a little bit. And that's by way of introduction, I'm gonna talk a little bit about physiatry and what we do uh, in, this, in our specialty. Um, basically, to put it in a, in a short form, um, 
Physiatry is a specialty that helps people with disabilities. We treat a variety of conditions that are affected by disorders of the nerve, muscle, bone, or joints, and conditions that usually lead to a disability or a chronic uh, lasting problem. Uh, our focus main, mainly is on restoring maximum function after a devastating illness or, disabling, uh, or, or disability. Uh, we treat the whole person. Uh, by that, I mean not only just the physical impact of disability, but also the uh, ways that disability is causing the person to interact or, or not to interact with the environment. Our goal really is to help the patient return back to the community in the best physical uh, ability that they have and not only allow them to be able to live independently or close to independently in their communities, but also to be able to interact with the environment to the best of their ability. Uh, next slide. So talking about stroke, uh, we put in a few of the statistics that are kind of interesting, maybe um, important to realize how uh, impactful this disorder is. Um, it affects about 800,000 people in the United States every year. And it is the fourth leading cause of disability in the USA. Um, also, it leaves most patients, about 80% of patients with some sort of long lasting disability and the recovery becomes a lifelong process. Uh, there are risk factors that need to be uh, considered when uh, patients present with stroke. Family history increases the chance of stroke and any kind of uh, previous uh, TIA or symptoms that are transient that may not have lasted too long can be should be considered as uh, a warning sign and should be taken seriously. Uh, these some of these uh, risk factors are preventable and therefore uh, need to be looked into before an event like a stroke occurs. The treatment of a stroke disorder. Uh, usually lies with what is causing the stroke, uh, either uh, the, it's an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. And I'll get a little bit in detail into the various types of strokes. Um, the, there are mainly two types of strokes. One is an ischemic stroke, uh, which means that there is blockage to circulation causing uh, brain dysfunction. The blockage of circulation can occur from two or three different ways. Uh, the most common way is an embolic uh, clot that is dislodged from one location and travels to uh, lodge itself in a, in a separate location in, uh, in the circulation of the brain, causing uh, that particular part of the brain, which is supplied by that blood vessel uh, to be affected. That is an embolic ischemic stroke. Usually the embolisms can come from the heart uh, and sometimes from the carotid arteries in the neck where these clots can easily get dislodged and travel uh, distally. The other type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke in which blood vessels can rupture spontaneously. Uh, one of the major causes of hemorrhagic stroke is hypertension. And, and if left untreated, as they say, it is a silent killer. Uh, it can damage the blood vessel wall to an extent that there is uh, rupture and hemorrhage. Uh, that hemorrhage can cause in itself some pressure because the brain is in an enclosed structure and extra extravasated blood can cause pressure on the brain. In addition, because of the hemorrhage, part of the brain may not get adequate circulation and that too can uh, affect the 
functioning of the brain. So these are two major causes uh, of, of strokes. The, one of the important things I, I want to mention here is the, uh, is the recognition of a stroke. So there's an acronym that everybody should be familiar with, be fast. And B stands for balance, E for eyes or visual blurring or visual uh, impairment. Uh, F is for face. If there's an asymmetry in the face, uh, that's an indication of a stroke occurring. A is for arm. If there's any weakness or, or loss of control or movement of the arm. Um, and S is for speech. If there's a slurred speech or or some impairment in speech, maybe slowed or uh, speech or change in the uh, pitch or uh, volume of the speech may indicate that a stroke is occurring. And the last uh, T is for time. Uh, this is important because each second, each minute counts. Uh, every minute that is, uh, that the brain is affected with loss of circulation, it loses about 1.9 to 2 million neurons. So you can realize how important it is to have medical attention as soon as possible. Uh, the, there have been significant advances in the treatment of stroke. Um, the ischemic stroke especially uh, can be treated by medications that can break up the clots uh, and restore circulation uh, as well as there are certain ischemic strokes that can be uh, treated by removal of the clot itself. Uh, so these two techniques are uh, frequently employed uh, if the patient reaches to the hospital and to the adequate care centers uh, within time. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, the risk factors. It's important to know uh, what risk factors may lead to another stroke and how we can prevent uh, another stroke by, or, or a stroke by controlling these risk factors. Um, these include hypertension or high blood pressure. Uh, so regular monitoring of blood pressure is important and maintaining it under control uh, is very, uh, and very important. Then high cholesterol levels. Uh, it has been established that high cholesterol is a risk factor for, for strokes uh, and need to be monitored and controlled. Uh, diabetes mellitus, so blood, high blood sugars uh, can lead to damage to the vessel wall and uh, cause either a clot to form uh, uh, and lead to strokes. Uh, other factors that may contribute to stroke include an arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat. Most commonly, this would be atrial fibrillation, uh, which can lead um, the blood to form clots on itself in the heart and uh, embolize to the brain circulation to cause a stroke. Uh, other factors include smoking, um, lack of exercise, obesity, uh, and family history. So these are some of the reversible factors uh, that we can influence to reduce the, the risk of strokes. Um, the common impairments that can occur in stroke include, of course, hemiplegia uh, or hemiparesis. Part of the uh, body becomes either weak or, or just completely uh, paralyzed. There could be Issues with balance and coordination causing people to fall and in, unable to ambulate. Uh, speech can be affected. So not, not only just the um, ability to, uh, pro, to enunciate properly, but also to find those right words uh, can be affected. Uh, there could be a, not only just weakness on one side, but in addition, neglect or inattention to that side. So patients sometimes fail to re recognize the affected side as part of their body, which can be uh, a cause for injury uh, 
etc. And then there is uh, visual field defects or deficits that can occur where one side of the body, um, the affected side, may also be uh, blinded by, for the patient. So they may run into objects on that side and uh, cause uh, an unsafe situation. Other impairments may include cognitive deficits, including memory, attention, um, difficulty in learning new tasks, uh, and uh, problem solving, things we call executive functioning. Uh, it also can cause trouble with swallowing, uh, also known as dysphagia. Uh, very important to make sure that the swallowing mechanism is working well after a stroke because otherwise the risk for aspiration or uh, the food supply or uh, liquids may go to the wrong in the wrong direction towards the lung and cause pneumonias. So one of the first things we do when a patient comes with a stroke is to see what their swallowing is before they're even uh, allowed to eat. Uh, there are pain syndromes associated with stroke, uh, numbness, tingling, pain, either localized uh, to one area or to the whole uh, affected side. Uh, in it, and as well, it can affect the bowel and bladder. So patients can either have difficulty in, in avoiding, uh, causing urine, because of urinary retention, or incontinence, which can cause, um, which can cause, which can be caused for um, frustration, um, as well as depression, can be uh, an issue from stroke. Skin breakdown. Yes, uh, other issues include skin breakdown because of lack of sensation, and patients may be. Uh, resting in one position for, for extended periods of time, causing pressure ulcers. Additionally, if there is incontinence, uh, that can also affect uh, the pelvic skin or the uh, perineal skin. Uh, so these are some of the impairments that can happen from stroke, uh, things we look at in general and try to either prevent them or treat them as, they're getting, uh, as the patients are getting rehabilitation. So I, I wanted to now uh, talk about what would happen after an acute rehab stay, because that's where the real hard work starts. Uh, and the, it's, it's left to the uh, patient, the family, uh, to provide some of the care in addition to the uh, home health services and outpatient services. So next slide, please. Okay, we have it. Um, most patients, when they leave acute inpatient rehab, uh, have some residual deficits. Uh, either they are physical or cognitive or swallowing or a combination of them all. Uh, so the, the key is to make sure that patients can stay at home or in their environment uh, despite these deficits and receive adequate services that continue to improve their condition. So usually after acute rehab, uh, we recommend uh, for patients that they uh, get home health services, including occupational therapy, physical therapy, nursing, and possibly speech therapy if needed. Uh, these therapies may last for several weeks uh, the role of a home health therapy is to make sure that patients are interacting with their environment in the home in a safe manner and that they can, uh, they can be improved to an extent where they uh, are close to independence in their home environment. Once that is achieved, uh, then usually home therapies transition to outpatient therapies. Uh, outpatient therapy is where uh, the fine tuning of a disability occurs. Uh, we look into uh, if there is a need for bracing or control of spasticity uh, or whatever factors that may be 
um, left behind after the stroke and can be addressed to improve the disability uh, is, is looked at. Uh, usually patients at this juncture uh, come see us uh, as physiatrists to assess their residual disability and provide recommendations for further treatment. So in addition to outpatient physical, occupational, and speech therapy, patients usually follow with physiatrists uh, to um, maximize their functional abilities. Um, next slide. So uh, this is where the hard work can, is really beginning. Uh, patients uh, are exposed to high intensity therapy, uh, as well as uh, the physiatry interventions. Now, these may include uh, Botox injections, for instance, for managing spasticity and determination of uh, bracing needs uh, as to what kind of brace and what would be an ideal brace for a patient if needed uh, to get them to the next level of function. Uh, we also look again at uh, any residual swallowing deficits. Uh, one of the tests we do uh, is called a modified barium swallow, uh, which, uh, which is a test to detect any swallowing difficulty by radiologic images. Uh, so this is a, a, a video recording of the swallowing mechanism, and it really fine tunes the, patient, the ability to detect a problem, as well as develop strategies that may help avoid aspiration. So this is another uh, test that we utilize if the patient has dysphagia. Next slide. Uh, this would be my message uh, for patients who are going through the process. Uh, it certainly is, stroke certainly is a devastating uh, illness that may, that the effects of which may last for extended period of time. Uh, so don't give up, keep continuing with uh, the process of rehabilitation and eventually patients do improve, uh, majority of patients do improve and uh, I have, uh, I, on many instances, uh, I have asked the patients to remember how they were when they were on the acute inpatient side right after their stroke and how they are the day that they are in outpatient therapies improving. And if they, if, if they can compare the two, patients do realize how much benefit and how, how much benefit they've attained and how far they have come with therapies. It is a gradual and slow process. So the increments are small. So it's difficult to, on a day-to-day -day basis, assess the progress. But once it's achieved, once uh, you know, patients get to the next level, uh, it is very rewarding for everyone. Uh, one of the concepts that I want to talk about is neuroplasticity. And what it is, is the ability of the brain to somewhat heal itself, as well as find other ways to uh, counteract the disability that has happened. Uh, the, one of the examples I give to consider neuroplasticity is that um, you know, if I were to come to work on a certain route every day uh, for 10 years, for 15, 20 years, uh, by that time, I know every pothole in the road, every uh, curve, and uh, practically somebody can, you know, drive to work uh, even in the dark or blind or blinded. Uh, however, if there was a detour in that route, then you have to find ways to get to your work, uh, and over time you find. Uh, ways that are more efficient and uh, can provide uh, and, and the shortest route. So this is what brain does. Once there's a detour from a stroke, the brain tries to find the best way of reconnecting itself. And that's a time consuming process. Uh, it, it also requires uh, diligent 
work and exercise. So brain has to do its function and exercise as well in order to regain uh, its strength and functioning. That, that's the concept of neuroplasticity. Uh, it is more prevalent or, uh, or the ability of the brain to heal itself is more when there is overall uh, improvement in health uh, as well as all other risk factors are being controlled. All right. take a, I'll, I'll give the next section to my partner, Dr. Fields, to talk about the gait dysfunction. Can you hear? Yeah. You have to mute. All right, sorry about that. I can help you guys. I think we might be okay now. Are we good? Yeah, Dr. Kamal, you'll just have to turn off the audio so you can't hear it, maybe. I'll try this. Let's take a little minute while they're uh making sure we don't hear an echo while they're talking because they're close to each other. How are we doing there, Jeff? Ooh, that's much better, thank you. Okay. So, uh, a major problem after stroke is is uh, the functional losses we talked about. Uh, a lot of that being gait dysfunction. So gait's a major sort of topic, uh, where where oh you know up to eighty eight percent of people um, have a as my colleague had mentioned a hemiparesis, which means that sort of uh, half the side of the body is weakened, whether it's uh, primarily arm or primarily leg, or in fact most of the time it's both, just to a certain extent. Um, and that, that unilateral or that one-sided weakness does cause a problem um, with the ability to walk. Uh, and with, with stroke, there um, is a spasticity component, which Dr. Kamal mentioned earlier, where you have a lot of flexion uh, and tone, which, which causes the leg and or arm to, to be in a position which is not necessarily the most conducive to for ambulation. Um, and, and these are things that we need to work on with regarding stretching, um, possibly interventions such as uh, Botox, as well as bracing, which we'll probably mention a little bit later on uh, with regarding uh, foot orthoses, uh, ankle foot orthoses, or even something a little larger, which are known as CAFOs, which include the knee, ankle, and foot, in order to help facilitate a, a much better and safer gait pattern um, because the the body wants to um, not, not trip on itself, so to speak. So we, we come up with ways or the brain subconsciously comes up with ways to clear the ground. So if there was an object on the ground in order, instead of to drag the foot where you would clip it and fall, uh, uh, you know, subconsciously the brain tries to compensate and whether that's like a circumduction, circumducted gate where you actually go out first and then up and over. Uh, or there's sometimes hip hiking or other ways so that you clear the ground and you, you don't fall or trip. And um, sometimes a, a, it can be modified with a brace so that you can have a more natural and safer gait pattern. Uh, there might even be a video link on the bottom here. I don't know if it works or not, if you want to try it. If not, we can proceed. It's not imperative.
so as you can see, uh, he had flexion both in his uh, uh, upper extremities where his elbow was flexed and brought in closer to his body. But uh, more importantly, because you, you don't really need the arm to clear the ground, was, was that shuffling gait pattern uh, uh, along the floor, which he had minimal clearance on that right leg, uh, even with the use of a straight cane, uh, which can be uh, dangerous. Once again, it could be a tree root, it could be a curb, it could be just a a toy on the ground, but if you don't get the clearance over that object, then that's where tripping comes into play. And I don't think we're going to have enough time to go through falls and the problems with falls, but we're all aware of how dangerous they can be, especially as we age, uh, primarily always thinking about a broken hip or some other problem associated with that, or even banging of the head. Okay, next slide. So uh, as I mentioned before, orthotics and, and, and bracing plays a big role. Uh, it comes from the uh, Greek word, uh, ortho, which means to straighten or align. Um, so in addition to having physical therapy, um, bracing can be uh, a valuable tool in, in helping to improve somebody's ambulation. Um, that can be used with physical therapy because you're, you're relearning how to walk in a certain way. Uh, and sometimes the brain is so fixated on being safe from previous injury that you don't utilize the brace the way it's intended because of the fear of a fall. Once again, a lot of this comes subconsciously uh, and it's not even uh, planned. Is the, is the brain is, is just so fearful of tripping that it allows you to clear the ground in a different way. But sometimes with the braces on, uh, they will assist in that where you have to relearn how to walk, uh, which will you know, improve the gait, improve, improve the speed as, and, as well as safety. Uh, and a big component is energy. And as we get older, the uh, energy level is, isn't as great as it once was. And if we're using more energy for every step or two steps that we take, the uh, uh, distance becomes much less than we can um, possibly do. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, there's something called a, a CAFO, which is a, a knee ankle foot orthoses. These are quite large. They're very bulky. Um, they can be uh, cumbersome and can be difficult to put on and off un unless somebody's there to actually help somebody. Um, but they can be appropriate if really needed, especially when ambulating short distances, uh, if we have such a substantial weakness of, of the lower limb. Uh, an AFO, an ankle foot orthoses, is, is a, a much easier uh, brace to wear. It's a much more effective brace to wear um, because controlling the ankle itself and the foot is a much easier task than can controlling the whole leg itself. Um, and these can be uh, just put into the shoe themselves um, a lot of people with foot drop, which is a, a common residual deficit with stroke, uh, will use an AFO, whether they're made from plastic or uh, a carbon fiber. There's lots of different materials, uh, and there's different ways to adjust them uh, to accommodate the deficiency, especially when, once again, we talked about spasticity or flexion, and, and people's uh, um, deficits don't allow them the range where they previously had to move that ankle or foot up and down. And you have to accommodate that with, with bracing and sometimes even lifts uh, so that uh, they're safe when ambulating. Next slide, we'll give you a, just an idea of some of these braces that we're talking about. Um, and, and the one on the left is, is your knee ankle foot orthoses, that kind of big cumbersome brace I was mentioning. Um, and it, it can be daunting to put on, to be perfectly honest. Um, the next two over, one is just a, a carbon fiber. Uh, and the other one is a plastic. And, and you can have lots of modifications to these braces. Um, if somebody may have some plantar flexion, you can put hinges in it. Um, you can make them reinforced if someone has no movement of their ankle up and down. Also, we talk about sort of medial and lateral ankle stability, your ability for your foot to go in or out. Uh, a lot, a lot, everyone should remember rolling or twisting their ankle at one point in time. And there is muscles in our legs that control the stability of the ankle. And if those are not as good as they once were, uh, we have to control that um, foot from constantly rolling out and, and design a brace to accommodate for that weakness. Next slide. So uh, as mentioned quite early on by my, my colleague, Dr. Kamal, pain is a major component post-stroke. Um, and there's varying various degrees of, of how much pain someone will uh, have. Um, it also depends on the, the type of stroke and the involvement. Uh, one of the most common uh, pain syndromes after stroke is, is called 
uh, complex regional pain syndrome um, that was put into the uh, complex regional pain one and two, it also known previously as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is known as RSD. Um, commonly in stroke, it's known as shoulder hand syndrome, where after the stroke and the nerves have uh, undertaken this, this, this event, um, we get sort of a, um, a fiery mess of neuropathic uh, pain and, and typically happens in, in both the shoulder and the hand. And it can kind of be uh, daunting to, to manage. So you get this, um, you know, sympathetic uh, from your system um, uh, drive, which, which isn't sort of uh, turned off. And it can affect the blood vessels, um, the motors. Uh, you get skin changes. It can go from being in an acute phase, very red and hot and swollen, to becoming very cool and pale and almost bluish. So they're... Um, as well as muscle loss and, and sort of the, the skin uh, thickness will also go away. It can be a, a challenging and very painful uh, problem. Uh, there are several uh, treatments for it, um, including ganglion blocks to, to see if, if that will affect the sympathetic discharge. Of course, range of motion therapy, this steroids in an acute phase, um, you have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, tricyclic antidepressants, anticonvulsants, topicals. There's a whole laundry list of medications that can be used uh, for pain mediation, but it, it happens to be a fairly challenging area uh, to control. Um, and and, and um, medications and injections sometimes go hand in hand, and a lot of times there's still residual discomfort and pain. Another common problem after stroke is uh, secondary to the weakness of the muscles that keep the joint, specifically the shoulder, uh, in place. It's, it's the muscles that keep it in place. And when the muscles are weakened because of a stroke, the, the bone itself and the shoulder seems to slip down a little bit. It's sublux, um, which can be also painful when you're moving your arm around. Um, there's been some literature regarding slings being pro and con. There's really no consensus on it. Uh, ideally, uh, gaining the strength back uh, and strengthening up the muscles is the best way to do it, but it does become an issue, especially immediately after stroke, as that weakness is very predominant right away. Another one is heterotopic ossification, and I like to call that bone growing where it doesn't belong. Um, and, and the body gets into this pro-inflammatory state uh, secondary to this injury, and these inflammatory mediators um, tell your body for some reason, hey, I'm being injured, let's grow bone. Uh, so a lot of times that will occur, whether it's in the hip is sort of the most common, can also occur in the elbow. But in general, the, the term itself heterotopic means anywhere other than really where it should be, and then ossification is bone growth. Next slide. Do you wanna talk about this spasticity or? Yeah, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dr. Kamal for his kind of area. Okay, one of the most common symptoms uh, of stroke is spasticity, uh, which means pulling or drawing. Uh, it is a motor disorder uh, that is characterized by the uh, abnormal velocity dependent stretching of the arm causing a response back, uh, resulting in a sensation of stiffness and tightness. Um, there is a phenomenon called clasp knife phenomena, which is typical for spasticity, uh, which means just like the clasp knife, there is resistance to movement of a joint. And after a certain uh, range of motion, then the uh, joint starts to relax and the arm or the leg starts to move better. Uh, there, what it practically does for the uh, for the patient uh, is causes difficulty in coordination and uh, and muscle movement, uh, which may affect functional activities, for example, ability to stand from a sitting position or ambulate uh, due to spas ambulation due to spasticity may be impaired. Um, spasticity can also cause painful muscle spasms. Uh, especially in muscles that cross two joints, for example, hamstrings or the gastrocnemius muscle in the calf 
or the biceps. Uh, these are the muscles that are long and slender and uh, are affecting two joints themselves. And when spasticity occurs in these muscles, uh, they can be painful as well as uh, may lead to contractures. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention about spasticity is that it's not all bad. Uh, it does help with motor movement if it is controlled or if it can be um, managed well. Uh, so one of the things we do with uh, managing spasticity is bring it to a level where the patient can uh, utilize it to, to a beneficial uh, functional activity. Um, usual early treatments include stretching with physical modalities, uh, splinting uh, or bracing or thrusters. There are medications that help reduce the spasticity or the tone. Uh, these include uh, oral medications such as uh, uh, tizanidine or baclofen. Then there are injectable medications. And one of the, one of the common ones nowadays utilized is Botox injections. Uh, the uh, Botox in itself uh, is a medication derived from botulinum toxin. And as that toxin tends to weaken the muscle, the scientists have been able to use that function of the toxin to reduce uh, spasticity. Uh, it, it is uh, performed every three months and under uh, what we call EMG guidance. Uh, there's an EMG machine that'll help us isolate the muscles that are in significant spasticity and uh, also to localize the increased muscle tone uh, where we can inject the medications and have the best effect. Um, there is also a surgical implanted device called intrathecal baclofen pump. Uh, what that does is uh, delivers the medication baclofen directly to the spine uh, through a pump and that direct delivery helps in a significant response and control to the spasticity without much of the side effects of these medications. In addition, you only need a smaller dose to get the best uh, if effect uh, through the intrathecal baclofen pump. It is a, a device that is the size of a, a ice hockey puck and it is installed uh, under the abdominal skin with a catheter that is connected to the pump and then inserted into the spinal canal. The pump can be programmed to deliver a, a specific amount of medication to the spinal cord, uh, sp spinal canal, and affect the, um, the spasticity in that particular way. It is most effective uh, in spasticity that is uh, involving the lower extremity. Um, one of the complications that can occur from untreated spasticity is uh, dystonia, uh, which would be uh, if muscles getting affected in, in different uh, locations uh, and causing uh, to varying degrees of contractures and pain. Um, you wanna talk about the next stuff is the cool stuff, so that's why right, because no, you talk about it. Okay. Yes. All right. So a couple of things uh, that I wanted to talk about is the new orthoses or new mechanisms that keep on being uh, introduced to the market for control of spasticity. Uh, one is the Myo Pro or the myoelectric arm orthoses. Uh, these are electrically controlled, uh, computerized, uh, orthoses that sense a person's movement and uh, augment the movement by their stimulation. So there are sensors that are built in the device 
that detect an EMG signal in the affected arm and then augment that signal to allow for an appropriate motion. Uh, there is a specific uh, glove that we use uh, nowadays at our outpatient clinic. It's called the Sabo Flex or the Sabo Glove. Uh, similar principle, electrical stimulation to paralyze muscles, especially in the hand, wrist, uh, to allow for movements such as grasp and release. Uh, it has been shown to have significant benefit, especially in fine motor skills, uh, which are important to patients affected from stroke. So the one thing I was going to add is that uh, these devices are, are really meant for someone who can initiate a movement or there's an electrical, you can appreciate the electrical movement of the arm. It's done through an EMG uh, so that it will activate the device as, as Dr. Kamal was mentioning in a certain way. So someone with very minimal sort of flexion at the elbow, say think about um, lifting up a, uh, a soda to drink from. Um, you couldn't reach your mouth by yourself secondary to the stroke, but with this device initiating that movement will allow uh, this device to lift and move your arm in a specific way so that you are able to do it. These devices are quite expensive. Um, I believe one of the companies or this one particularly is based out of Boston um, and they're very difficult to obtain. Um, there's a rigorous sort of a protocol in order to get uh, approved for them. Uh, and as with anything that with quite co expensive cost, insurance, you know, seems to uh, butt their heads into things in certain ways. But um, these are these are kind of some of the newer devices that they've been working on over the years uh, to compensate for dysfunction after the stroke. OK, uh, one of the this, one of the points I wanted to uh, bring across is that uh, the most important thing that affects a person's uh, ability to go home and stay home is their uh, control over bladder or bowel. Uh, so we try during their stay on the acute rehab side to, to get that uh, as best as we can. Most of the time, the problem is uh, not enough uh, warning and not enough ability to, uh, to control to get to the to the restroom, so there's urgency uh, involved, which leads to incontinence. Um, one of the things we instill in patients, if that's the case, uh, during their acute rehab stay, is timed voiding, uh, and we kind of drill it to a point where it becomes a habit. Uh, the uh, the process is to get to the restroom every so often, even if the there's not enough desire or urgency at that time. Once that routine gets set in, uh, there is better control on the bowels, on the bladders, uh, ability to uh, retain when it's needed and avoid when it's needed. Uh, and that has a major impact on the uh, ability of the patients to stay home. Similar situation with bowels, uh, we try to uh, develop a bowel program uh, with medications, uh, structure to allow for uh, bowel movements to occur at a certain time of day where the patients can be prepared for them. Uh, these two important uh, factors um, determine a major uh, decision for patients to be able to go home uh, and stay in their home environment. Um, with that, I think we have a conclusion of our presentation, um, and I will be open to questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for that overview. I think it's, you can see with all the heroic things you guys are doing to help people recover and cope with the disabilities that they have from stroke, all the more reason why the prevention and the risk factors, not smoking and eating healthy and exercising and keeping your blood pressure under control are that much more important. So you can avoid having to go through all of this stuff. Um, but if you do find yourself or a loved one in this situation, it's great to know that we have your expertise to help them recover. Um, just a reminder to the group that um, the Q and a box is down at the bottom. Um, you'll see where you do the mute buttons and things. Normally there's a little Q and a, so 
can put some questions in. Um, and then I can ask the panelists those questions. We did have one question that came in that um, was about the rehab, just asking about besides stroke, are there other conditions that you treat, whether it be the inpatient or in the outpatient rehab, um, in addition to stroke? That was one question that came through. So I, I'll talk about the variety of conditions we treat on the inpatient side. Uh, there is significant uh, number of uh, needs that patients may have uh, during their hospitalization. Uh, so uh, to name a few of the conditions that we bring in are patients who have spinal cord injuries or uh, any m medical illness that may affect the spinal cord itself. Uh, brain injuries, uh, either traumatic or non-traumatic, uh, and then in general, uh, diseases that might affect the uh, spine or the limbs. So for instance, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis with associated disability, uh, multiple sclerosis with disability, uh, Parkinson's disease with disability, uh, another syndrome that's called the Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, that may lead to weakness and acute weakness uh, and associated disability. Uh, in addition, we uh, bring patients in that may have had um, amputations, either uh, the lower extremity or the upper extremity, uh, either below the knee or above the knee. Uh, so multiple different diagnoses that come on the inpatient rehab side. Any, in general, any long lasting uh, disabling condition uh, that would require physical uh, rehabilitation would be considered for an acute rehab uh, admission. Uh, I'll ask my colleague to talk about the outpatient side. So in addition to follow-up in an outpatient setting uh, for the inpatient reasons that my colleague mentioned, um, we'll see a, a wide variety of disorders, everything from neck and back pain to hip and shoulder pain. Once again, as we mentioned earlier, we're kind of a non-surgical specialty. So a lot of times in, in general, uh, whether it's arthritis related or musculoskeletal related, it doesn't necessarily always require surgery, uh, uh, not to take away from my orthopedic colleagues, but um, a lot of times they can be managed uh, with medications, uh, with injections, and with therapy. Uh, and that's the area that we would really focus on uh, before eventually at some point, un fortunately or unfortunately or not, they may need a new hip or a new shoulder. Uh, so the variety of disorders that we see can range from just general musculoskeletal, hip, shoulder, ankle, foot, um, and, and spine to following up after an inpatient stay, or even if they never went to inpatient and they had a concussion. Uh, or they have some difficulty swallowing for whatever reason, if it's Parkinson's or some type of structural, but uh, it's a focus on um, uh, the, the physical body itself and, and treating a wide variety and range, including an orthotics clinic that me and Dr. Kamal run for post-amputation, for foot drop, um, which doesn't have to be necessarily from stroke. It could be from uh, an injury to the leg. It could be from a perineal neuropathy uh, to other disorders. In addition to some of the procedures, such as an EMG, which is performed uh, to try to find if there's a nerve issue um, or a muscle issue that's causing um, a certain wide variety of symptoms, such as numbness, tingling, and or pain. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think we'll probably have time for one more question. Let me see. Why don't we end it since it's COVID pandemic time? Um, have you seen patients with COVID either just from the illness um, requiring rehab or um, treating COVID patients, anything COVID related relative to what you guys do? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we've we've ha had our uh, share of patients who have had COVID related disability. Uh, as you know, it, it is a novel virus. So we are still trying to figure out how many ways that that uh, virus can affect the human body. One of the common uh, presentations is COVID pneumonia, uh, which can be quite disabling. Not only does it last for a while, but it can affect different 
It can affect widespread parts of the lung, causing severe shortness of breath and uh, inability to exchange oxygen. Uh, we've had patients who have had to be intubated on the acute hospital side, uh, and for a prolonged period of time, uh, that has led to further complications, uh, including what we call critical illness myopathy or critical illness neuropathy. Uh, that is just uh, because the patient has been prolonged, uh, has had a prolonged hospitalization. Uh, their muscles and nerves start to decline and deteriorate, resulting in severe weakness. So these are some of the presenting features that we see in patients who have had COVID and have come to us for rehab. Uh, one other complication that is somewhat, uh, that has become more prevalent in COVID-induced, uh, COVID-related uh, um, pa patients in, is uh, hypercoagulability. So patients have had a blood clots form, very common with COVID, especially in the lower extremities, and especially in the ones who haven't been mobile uh, during their hospital stay. So we look forward, we look uh, at uh, making sure that we are preventing uh, these clots from forming. Uh, most commonly they occur in the lower extremities, but then, then they can also travel and uh, travel to the lungs and cause severe uh, hypoxia and shortness of breath uh, symptoms. These are the common uh, complications that we have seen with patients who have uh, presented to us with COVID. Uh, the more disabling presentations occur when patients have comorbidities, uh, for example, diabetes uh, or high blood pressure, uh, then, then these, uh, these symptoms are of, of more severity. Um, certain populations uh, are more affected for some reason from COVID, uh, including uh, Hispanic and black minority population seems to uh, have a more uh, severe presentation from COVID. Uh, we've had the experience over the past six months uh, of several of these patients coming to our unit uh, and, and we have been able to isolate the, uh, the patients in their rooms with proper uh, safety precautions uh, and also provide them with the rehab that they need. Uh, so th these arrangements have really helped us to be the um, only rehab facility that can safely take care of these patients. Um, so, yeah. That's definitely a pretty incredible disease that we're learning more and more about, and we're all excited to hopefully put it behind us at some point soon. But it's interesting how the risk factors for stroke um, and as dramatic as what you were talking about and how that can affect you and the risk factors for some of the other conditions for COVID do overlap. So all the more reason to, to try to modify and minimize those risk factors whenever possible. Um, so I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. I really appreciate the, the two panelists that we've had and their expertise and all the hard work that they do for the community and for the hospital and for the people that joined us. I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to hear about some of the stuff that's happening at Newport and some of the, um, both the inpatient and outpatient rehab services that we're offering and the things that are happening here. Um, we're planning a, another virtual community lecture series for December. We're hoping to have Dr. Mason, our total joint surgeon and um, doc that does jo joint replacements. So um, we'll get that one lined up. So stay tuned for next month's virtual community lecture series. But for tonight, I will say a huge thank you to Dr. Kamal and to Dr. Fields for their presentation, for their expertise. And thank you all for joining us for our community lecture series. If you have thoughts about topics that are interesting to you that you'd like to hear about, or if you have questions that we didn't get a chance to get to tonight, um, please send an email to either myself or to Eric Gabrielson, who sent out the invite um, to a member of our team. We'll be happy to um, get the answers for you and get those, um, that information to you as quickly as we can. So I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. Hope everybody stays safe and stays healthy, and we will see you again next month in December. <laughs>